Good morning. Good to have you with us today. Thank you for staying with us and joining us as we're going through Revelation together. If you're just joining us for the first time, when we are going through the book of Revelation, we're seeing Christ. Uh, he's in charge. He's in control. And he's going to be fulfilling the will of the Father, showing us the future, the future of every believer. Everything we ever long for, every hope for, is going to be fulfilled in Jesus Christ. That's what Revelation is all about. And it's about speaking to his church so that we live faithfully, obediently, that we be soul winners for Jesus Christ. Revelation is to motivate you and I to walk faithfully. So we've seen uh, Jesus Christ. There's three sections here. Number one is, is John write about the things that you have seen. And what he saw initially in chapter one was Christ in a way he'd never seen him before. Um, risen, ascended, glorified, majestic, undescribable, and the one who is revealing all that is unfolding here. Chapter 2, we come to the seven churches, specifically seven historical churches, but not only those churches, the churches that Paul wrote to, and the church today, the universal church. Jesus is writing to, he's transforming his church, he's doing that today. And what he wrote to those seven churches were words also to our heart, and we've seen those and been challenged by those. Now we're, now we're moving into the third and final section. We're only in chapter 4. But this third section takes us all the way to the end of the book of Revelation. That third section is, John, write about the things that will be, the things that are going to happen. They haven't happened yet. John, I want you to write about those. So uh, that's what we're going to see. In, in Revelation chapter 4, we see this. And John wrote, after this, I looked, after, after the church age, after chapter 2 and 3, and behold, a door was standing in heaven. And the first voice which I had heard speaking to me like a trumpet, that's chapter 1, verse 10, was Christ, said, Come up here, and I will show you what must take place after this. So John is, John is going to be ushered into the very presence of the Lord. We're coming into the throne room of God himself. Words can't even describe what we're going to see. What's conveyed is, is for our understanding, and it boggles our mind. Um, maybe you've been to the White House. Maybe you've been to... to uh, Thrones of Queens, I don't know, traveled around the world. But I tell you what, there's nothing that can compare with what we see here about God the Father, about Jesus Christ, about them together in heaven. What, a, what an amazing peace that we have here. And so we come to Revelation 4 and 5. We step into a heavenly throne room scene, and that's going to be that's going to be the context for what happens in the next two chapters. The thrust of these two chapters is this. It's about God. It's about God the Father. It's about God the Son. And it reveals this one thing, that God is worthy. He's worthy of all praise. He's worthy to do what's about to unfold. What we, what we have here is a theodicy. It's a term which simply means this. It's a defense of God. It's a justification for God to do what's about to unfold in chapter 6 through chapter 18, 19, the tribulation. God doesn't need a defense. But in his kindness and grace, he offers to us rational rationale for why he's about to do what he's to do. He gives us a glimpse into his character, his attributes, who he is, and he lets us see those not only on printed page in words and in concepts, but in, in real life as we see him here before the throne. It's an amazing piece. What, to, see, to see God, to see him on the pages here, to just, uh, to just know that this is a reality that is, that is far beyond our ability to comprehend. And John's trying to put it into words that we can understand. So let's see what John says, what he writes about. God is worthy in every way to do all that he's done, to do what he's doing now, and to do what he's going to do in the pages that are going to unfold. How is that so? What do we see here? Well, the very first thing that we see about God here is, is the obvious. It's in verse 1 and verse 2. God's in heaven. He's worthy because he is in heaven. You know what? That's his home. It's not our home, not yet. If you're, a, if you're a child of God, one day we will be in heaven with the Lord. We will be with the Lord in a new heaven, a new earth. But this is his home. This is his dwelling place. This is the nerve center of all that God does. He gives us a glimpse into, into a piece of that. Of course, God is not just in one spot in one place. But this is the third heaven. This is, this is where God is, where he dwells beyond the universe that he's created. This is his domain, his place. And he allows us through John to have a glimpse into what is seen here. Paul had a, had a similar uh, 
opportunity like this, and he couldn't even describe what was going on. He spoke of himself in the, in the third person, and he says, you know what? I was caught up to the third heaven, whether in the body or out of the body, I don't know. But God knows. And you know what? John is lifted up into heaven. In the body, in the spirit, we don't know. But we know it's real. He's trying to convey to us what he sees. And so it says here in verse 1 that a door is opened into heaven. A door is open. Here's a voice speaking. That voice is Christ. We tie that to, again, chapter 1. But the door is heaven. That's a, I tell you what, folks, that's a rarity. In the scriptures, to see God open the door of heaven. We only have a few glimpses of that where we see. We see Ezekiel in chapter 1. God lifts him up, opens the door of heaven, and from that he conveys the visions of, of the glory, the majesty, the, 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 the terrifying holiness of, of God before the people of Israel. The door is open for Ezekiel. We see Jesus Christ when he was baptized, the doors of heaven opened and the Spirit of God came down and the, and the voice of the Father spoke and, and we see that, that affirmation of the deity of Jesus Christ. When Stephen was martyred for Jesus Christ, he identified with Christ and he paid with his life. The door was open. And he saw Jesus, after he was crucified, standing at the right hand of God, the Father. God opened the door for Peter and lifted down the, the, the sheets, the four corners, filled with all this unclean food. And he said to Peter, eat. And he was conveying to Peter that his ministry was not just only to Jew, but also to Gentile, which were considered unclean. But because he, got a, he had a direct communication with God, the door was open. And then, of course, Paul's experience in, first, in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, actual 2 Corinthians. He's lifted to the third heaven and communes with God. You know, we can't go to heaven like that. There have been a lot of books written on people going to heaven after death. None of those books convey with accuracy what the Scripture speaks of. None of those books convey what, what ought to be the focal point of any of those books. That's Jesus Christ. That's God himself in detail and in harmony with the scriptures. None of those books convey that. It's all feeling and goodness and all that, but nothing about nothing about Christ. You know what, if we go to heaven, we're going to talk about Jesus Christ. Here we have a glimpse of the Father, whom Jesus Christ is honoring in all that he does. Our door is different than what we see here. Our door, well, is simple. We see in Isaiah 57 a glimpse of that. For thus says the one who is high... And lifted up, who inhabits eternity, whose name is holy. I dwell in the high and holy place. That's the Father. That's God Himself. But He continues, what a beautiful piece He says here. But I also dwell with Him who is of a contrite and lowly spirit. I, to revive the spirit of the lowly, to revive the heart of the contrite. Through faith we come to Him as broken people, and He heals, and He revives, and He and instills life in, in a in a individual for the first time and, and we become a child of God. That's that open door that we have. An, an open door that we have in Christ is through prayer. Matthew 6, 9. Pray like this. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Prayer brings us into the very throne room of grace. Just like John is. We can't visually see it. We can't visually experience it. But we are experiencing the same power, the, the same um, access to God that John did in a different way. We will see God when he brings us home to be with him. Jesus Christ himself, the significance of this open door is this, that we need a Savior. When that door is closed, sin closes that door for us. Jesus says there's only one way to heaven. There's only one way to that access. There's only one way to that throne room. Jesus says, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. John 10, Jesus says, I am the door. If we're going to come to the Father, we must come through Christ. See, John here is lifted up, has that relationship already with Jesus Christ. Matthew chapter 7. There will be many who want access to heaven, many who think they're going to heaven. They'll say, Lord, Lord. But Jesus says the one who comes to heaven ultimately is the one who does the will of the Father. That's not works. That's reflection of relationship. And he says the one who comes into heaven will be the one who has honored me by doing what I have called them to do, the will of the Father. So the significance of this open door for us is this. We can have a relationship. We can have access. Our mediator is Jesus Christ. Our access is Jesus Christ. Do you have that this morning? Another reason that God is worthy is another very obvious piece here, but it's significant and it's important. In verse 2, we see this. And uh, at once I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne stood in heaven with one seated on the throne. Jesus is in the Spirit. 
led by the Spirit, filled with the Spirit, lifted up by the Spirit. All those things are probably true. And he says, As I, am I lifted into heaven? Here's what I see. I see one seated on a throne. There's a throne and there is one seated on the throne. Again, a description of God. When he's seated, the work is the work is under his control. He is sovereign in every way. Let's look at that. We see glimpses of a God seated on the throne, and yet we see him working his will, even as he's seated in majesty. In Isaiah 6, the description is this. God is high and lifted up, and yet he's seated right there on the throne. Holy, holy, holy is the worship given to him. Isaiah says, Woe to me, for I am a man of unclean lips, we see here. In Daniel 7, we get a glimpse of G of God, the Father, seated, and yet he is he is sovereign in judgment. He is sovereign in control. There we have the, the, the glimpse of the of the empires that will rule the world, and yet the empire of of Jesus Christ of God will overthrow them all and be eternal. God is in control. Psalm 47, 8. God is seated and yet he is reigning over the nations. He's in control. Revelation chapter 7 gives us this glimpse. God is seated and yet what's happening? He's being served and he's being worshipped. He is God Almighty, worthy of all praise, of all worship. We see in Revelation chapter 20, God is seated. God the Father is seated. What's happening is the great white throne. He is judging mankind through Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ will be the one. But God the Father is there. He is seated over all. And heaven and earth will flee. He is seated, and yet he is, in, he is in all power. He doesn't need to stand. He is seated. Terminology of just him simply being in control. Folks, he's in control today of your life, of the politics, of this nation, of the COVID, of everything that's going on. He's in control. You and I can trust him. We see in Revelation 21, he is seated, but what is he doing? I am making all things new. He is transforming lives. Folks, God is in control. He is seated. He is on the throne. The significance for that, for us, is this. He is supreme. He is able. Many are the plans in the mind of a man. You know, we've got a lot of plans, a lot of things we want to do, think we're going to do. But it's the purpose of the Lord that will stand. He's on the throne. His purpose will be accomplished. Matthew chapter 6. The prayer is this. God, may your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. God, may your will be done in my life, through my life. May I accomplish, fulfill your will. Know the blessing of that. God is able to help us do, accomplish, fulfill His will from the throne room through our lives into what He desires to accomplish through us. And, and because of that, He tell, reminds us in Isaiah 41, 10, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. I will give you everything you need. I'll strengthen you. I'll encourage you. I'll hold you up with my righteous right arm. He's in control. That's encouragement, folks. The third thing that we see here is in, in verse 3. And he who sat there, the one who sat on the throne, had the appearance of Jasper and Carnelian. Okay? What we see here is, is God is simply this. He's indescribable. John tries to describe the Father. All he can do is, is convey this. All he can do is convey this. He uses two terms. Jasper. Jasper is like uh, crystal. It's like diamonds. It is, it is pure in its clarity. In, in its brightness, it reflects lights like diamonds. Uh, the, just the brilliance, the brilliance that came off of the Father would have been brighter than a thousand suns. We see that in Scripture, right? And he was, and he was, light coming off was like carnelian, or in some translations, sardius. Okay, sardius. And so that would have just been uh, that flaming, fiery orange colors coming off. And so as John looked at the Father. He didn't describe physical features. He didn't describe uh, what God the Father looked like. He described what he understood, what he saw. He couldn't see the Father in his pure essence. He couldn't live. And so he gives us that glimpse. And so, and so just pouring off of the person of, of God the Father is, is colors and majesty. That, is, that Folks, it's beyond description. You can just imagine all the colors that are going on. Psalm 104, O Lord my God, you are very great and you are clothed with splendor and majesty and you cover yourself with light as with a garment that's what we see here in the heavenly scene first timothy six god alone has immortality and who and dwells in unapproachable light who no one has ever seen or can see to him be honor and eternal dominion john saw him but not like this no one can see him in his pure essence no one can see him in his purity in his full holiness or we would die 
Scriptures make that very clear. We can't see the Father like that. John saw a manifestation of the Father. John saw a, an, an element of the Father, but not in his full purity. And, and this, is, this is beyond description. It puts, it puts John in, in, in a, uh, just a hum, humble place that he, that he deserves by understanding who he is in the presence of. These same colors, stones, were used in the, in the garments that the priests wore in Exodus chapter 28. The ephod that they would wear and the 12 stones, and there could be a lot to be said about that, but two of those stones were the sardis and the jasper. And so we, and so we just have represented in their authority and their ministry as reflection of God. Everything they did was a reflection of God. Even these stones reflect somehow what John saw here in Revelation chapter 4. What's the significance of this brilliance of, of God? Well, you know what? John couldn't see God in his, in his whole fullness, in his whole period. But you know what? We can know God. You can know God. That's the beauty. That's the gospel. That's the invitation. Romans chapter 1 verse 20. God has revealed his power and his divine nature simply through creation and all that we see. Romans chapter 2. He's revealed his law in our hearts. He's given us the, his conscience, the conscience which we can sear so that we can know right from wrong. We can know a part of God's heart. Psalm 19, the heavens declare the glory and his handiwork, his work among us. Scriptures tell us that he sent the prophets. He sent his son. Not only did he send his son, God became flesh. That's what he did. And, he, and God, God who is there on the throne, he dwelt among us in the person of Christ. The majesty and the glory of of God the Father we saw in the person of Jesus Christ. That's what we saw in the Gospel of John. John chapter 17. John writes, this is, this is why I write. This is what I want you to know. This is eternal life that you may know that Jesus Christ, the one true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. He, John says, I wrote this so that you would know God and that you would know his son, Jesus Christ. God is worthy. He's indescribable. Beyond words, beyond description. There's nothing that has ever been created that, that is of the majesty of the Creator, of who He is. There's nothing in our life and that we can, man can make that can rival what we see here of God, His attributes and what surrounds Him. We see also in verse 3, as John continues, and around the throne was a rainbow that had the appearance of an emerald. And so we see this God is worthy. He is the God of promise. Now, I would get a picture of a green rainbow, but I can't find a picture of a green rainbow, right? They don't exist. Now, this is the closest thing, the Northern Lights, beautiful. I've seen the Northern Lights a couple times, actually. But here, in their brilliance, I've never seen quite that brilliant. That green sheen, is just, it's just everywhere. The color, beyond description. And, um, and so we see here this, this rainbow that's green in nature, and it's emerald, and colors are you just... And this throne room scene, colors are everywhere. The brilliance of the riches of God, the... the the, the gemstones and the colors and, the, and the, just the majesty that surrounds the throne of God. Here we have this rainbow. And I think it's specific. I think it's purposeful. I think it is a reminder of promise. Genesis 9, God put the rainbow in the cloud. He's, he said, it's a sign of my covenant to you, Noah, between me and the earth. I will remember my covenant that's between me and you as all humanity and every living creature of the flesh. That, the, that I'll never flood the earth again with waters. Never. The earth will, earth will never be destroyed with water like it was here. But not only that, it's a reminder of God's judgment. Every time we see a rainbow, it's a promise. God promises never to do that again. But it's also a reminder that he did judge the earth, that he is a God who judges. We're going to see that in a moment. But the rainbow is more than that. As we look on this heavenly scene, a rainbow is, is more. Ezekiel chapter 1. Ezekiel saw what appeared to be like a bow that's in the cloud on the day of the rain. And, and the appearance was bright all around, and such was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. And when I saw it, I fell on my face. It reflected simply this, the glory of God. And the rainbow ought to remind us as well simply this, of the majesty and the glory of God. Folks, it seems so out there, what is described here, what we see on the pages of God's Word, because we've never experienced it, yet we will. It's by faith that we look to him with eyes of hope and certainty and belief and in, in, in our hearts say, Lord, I believe. And one day I'm going to see you like this. And what God has provided for us, for those that he loves, is beyond comprehension. Folks, never lose sight of 
the wonder of God. Because one day you and I are going to experience the wonder of God. Not the ravages of sin that is so much a part of our life. Not, not the hardship of life. Someday those things will be behind. Don't forget that. We're going to be in the purity of relationship with God someday. We must hold on to that promise. What's the significance of that for us? The rainbow is God's promise. All of God's promises find their yes in Him. 2 Corinthians 1.20 And so Romans 4 just reminds us of Abraham. Abraham was fully convinced that God was able to do what He promised. And that faith was counted to him as righteousness. That faith revealed his trust in God and it put him in a relationship with God where he was right with God. When you and I believe God like that, we put our faith and trust in him at the moment of salvation and then for obedience every day and for mission every day and for soul winning every day and for faithfulness in, in, in our life, we are saying, Lord, I believe you. And we are re being reminded of the promises of God and, and living upon them and acting on them. And so we're reminded in Hebrews 10 to be unwavering, to continue, continue to, to go forward, and, and remember the one who made the promise, he's trustworthy. And so be faithful every day. Folks, be faithful every day. Serve the Lord faithfully every day. Honor him faithfully every day. Don't forget what he's promised for you and to you. May we live for him well because of the promises of God. Now I want to take a side note here for just a second. Two elements in here. We're not going to go in detail, but I want to mention them. It's the 24 elders and the four living creatures. Unusual elements we have here. So let's look at those. Uh, verse 4, And around the throne were 24 thrones. Seated on the thrones were 24 elders, clothed in white garments with golden crowns on their heads. We'll say more about them later, but here we have the 24 elders. And then we have in verse 6, And around the throne, on each side of the throne, are four living creatures full of eyes in the front and behind. And the first living creature was like a lion. The second living creature was like an ox. And the third living creature with the face of a man. And the fourth living creature like an eagle in flight. And the four living creatures, each of them with six wings, are full of eyes all around and within. Wow, these are, this is incredible. I mean, we don't see anything like this ever. Okay? Let's take the 24 elders. Who are they? What are they? There's no easy answers to this. Some would say they're angels. They represent us, okay? Now in Revelation, you never see angels that are called elders. They have positions. You never see angels who wear white in Revelation and wear crowns. Not in Revelation, okay? Uh, some tie angels to the, uh, uh, to the churches, the messengers of the church, but, but we see those as pastors, not an angel. We talked about that earlier. Yet we see in Colossians that angels have authority. They are authorities. Eldership is an authority. They have authority. They're invisible. They have authority. Sometimes they manifest themselves. In John and, and Matthew, we see them wear white. Uh, are these angels? It's possible. It's possible that they're human beings. Okay, They may be angels. If they are, they represent us. If they're people... They represent us. We're going to see that. Uh, do they tie back some, some tie, whoever these are, back to uh, the 24 orders of the priests and Levites together in, in uh, 1 Chronicles 23 and 24? Uh, they were different orders, tiers of, priest, of the priesthood and the, and, the, and the Levites. And so they see this as being a reflection of that. I see it probably as being... Uh, those are representing all the redeemed who have ever been saved. Are they human? Maybe. Are they angels? Maybe. I don't know. I think they're human, maybe. But we're going to see that, okay? It seems clear that if this is the case, they are representing all who have been saved, Jew and Gentile, because the, the clearest picture of this we see in Revelation 21. Revelation 21, we see the, the New Jerusalem, the city of Jerusalem. It had a great high wall. With 12 gates, the gates at the gates were 12 angels, and on the gates, the names of who? 12 tribes, and the sons of Israel were inscribed. So the gates, you have angels at the gates, but the gates themselves represented Israel, the 12 tribes of Israel. Then you have the foundations of the city. You have 12 foundations. On them were the 12 names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. 
have the 12 apostles, which represent Gentiles, the church. And, and here you have, with clarity, uh, a connection that's possible that these, that these 24 elders do indeed represent simply the believers who have come to faith in Jesus Christ, Jew and Gentile. Um, we don't have a final answer. I don't have a final answer. Final answer. I don't think any of us can ever know because it doesn't tell us. Uh, then you have the four living creatures, even more amazing, more peculiar. Well, it seems clear that these are angelic beings, not human beings, right? I have never met any human being that looks quite like this. Uh, in Ezekiel chapter 1, you have a very similar uh, experience by Ezekiel. Not identical piece by piece, but very similar. You see the same creatures here, the same kind of creatures here. They're identified in Ezekiel and identified in Isaiah as cherubim and seraphim. Okay, different kinds of angels, different terminologies. We don't have time to go into that. Here we have representations. They're like a lion, an ox, a man, and an eagle. There's four elements here of these four creatures. It seems, it seems, well, in just a second. They have six wings. Those wings are used for different purposes. If you look in Ezekiel and you look here, you see those wings function in different ways. They have eyes everywhere, which seem to convey uh, uh, wisdom, uh, discernment, the ability to see everything. Uh, um, Nothing is hidden. They're not God. They're not deity, but, but yet they are instruments of God. They're tools of God. They're, they're in service to the Lord. They're the closest thing to the throne. They, have, they, have, uh, they, they are privileged in that respect, and, and they are clearly servants of God Almighty himself, and they are at his disposal. And um, some would say, well, they represent uh, Christ. They represent the different... The different, different descriptions of Jesus Christ in the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. But that seems, that seems to be like a stretch. stretch. There's, not a, there's not a clear um, connection between those descriptions and what we see here. The better description seems to have a direct link uh, scripturally that these four creatures created by God to serve him are there for a specific purpose, and that's to, that's to remind us that God keeps his promises. Genesis chapter 9, God makes a covenant with Noah after the flood. I establish my covenant with you and your offspring after you, with every living creature that is with you, the birds, the livestock, and every beast on the earth. So you have the man, you have, you have the eagle, you have the lion, you have the ox, you have all four elements here. And what this is, is God's promise to all of creation, not to destroy it like he did. God keeping his covenant. And, and these seem to be a reminder to us of God's covenant-keeping promise. Whoever they are, whatever they're doing, they seem to be connected to that purpose. That God is reminding us through John that he is still on the throne and he's still keeping his promise to you and I, to this world, to this earth, as he said. Uh, so there's a lot more that could be said about them we're not going to right now. Okay, God is, God is worthy. He is, well, let's see, verse 4. You see a description here of the elders. Um, they're seated on thrones. They're clothed in white garments and have golden crowns on their heads. I can't describe all these things and what they're there for. Why did they receive them? What do they represent? The white in Revelation that we see later, we can communicate clearly what it is and may be connected to that. We'll talk about that later as in relation to believers, if these are genuine people. Okay? But what we see is this. Whatever they have has been given to them by God. They're on thrones given to them by God. They're clothed in white provided by God. They have crowns given to them by God. All that they have is given to them by God. That's the reality for all of us. It reminds us here that God's the giver of all good things. Without answering all the questions that are here that we can't always answer, we can see this about God. He is worthy because he's good all the time, folks. James 1.17 reminds us that every good gift comes from God. Everything good comes from him. It starts from the throne room of God himself and emanates into all of humanity. The significance is that is God blesses all the earth with good, with general blessing, but eternal goodness, eternal blessing starts with relationship. Ephesians 2, 8, it starts through faith. And even that's a gift of God, folks. If you know Jesus Christ as Savior, would you just thank the Lord for that? Would you praise Him and honor Him and worship Him because of that? It's from Him alone. Hebrews chapter 11 says, Faith, look what faith does, look what it unlocks. Because of faith, I'm able to please God. Because of faith, I'm able to draw near to God. Because of faith, he rewards me for faithfulness and for obedience. Because of faith, I'm able to seek him and walk with him. I'll tell you what, faith is God's goodness in our life. You know that? 
You experience that, you're practicing that every day. Live by faith, folks, every day. Okay, another thing we see here is in verse 5. Verse 5, we continue. And from the throne came flashes of lightning and rumblings and peals of thunder. This is, a, this is a quite the scene here. Any time in Revelation that we see this, it's associated with the judgment of God. We're going to see that unfold here in the book of Revelation. Four different times we see in the next chapters to come, chapter 8, verse 5, chapter 11, verse 19, chapter 16, verse 18, chapter 19, verse 6, we see, we see these same scenes, same descriptions, and they culminate with the seventh seal, the seventh trumpet, the seventh bull, and then they culminate with the second coming of the Lord when he brings judgment upon the unsaved. And so we see that there. This is a, this is a description of the, of the wrath of God that's going to come shortly. And uh, this thunder, this lightning, all these things that are around is, in, is an expression of the punishment of God that's about to come. Exodus chapter 19, when God came to Mount Sinai, the people were terrified of that. Same description because of the holiness of God. The thunder, the lightning, the thick clouds, and the people, they were afraid, they trembled. They said, Moses, you talk to us, not God. They were terrified because of their sin. Unconfessed sin, the holiness of God. What's the significance? The significance in, in brief is just this. God's wrath is very real, folks. Romans 8, the wrath of God is revealed from where? From where? From heaven. Against all ungodliness and unrighteousness. Romans 5, verses 8 and 9 remind us that God pours out his love and God pours out his wrath. One day, every individual is going to stand before the Lord. Will you stand there having received his love? Will you stand there unprotected from the wrath of God because you've never experienced the loving grace of God and salvation? That's the significance of this reminder to our hearts. Verse 5, as we continue, we see this. And before the throne were burning seven torches of fire, which are the seven spirits of God. Here we, have the, here we simply have the wisdom of God, the spirit of the wisdom of God. God is spirit. God the Father is spirit. He has given us his Holy Spirit. This is, these are expressions we've already seen here in Revelation. Revelation chapter 1, chapter 3, chapter 5 of the spirit of God. The seven spirits are before his throne. The words of him who had the seven spirits of God, the Lamb of God, that's Jesus Christ, with seven horns, seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. This is a description of none, none other than the Holy Spirit of God, which indwells us, lives with us. We are, the, we are the tabernacle, the temple of God, because the Holy Spirit indwells us. God lives within us. God alone is wise. It is, it is a reminder of the wisdom of God. He's on the throne. Oh, the depth of God's wisdom. His riches, his knowledge, they are unsearchable. They are inscrutable. Ephesians chapter 1 reminds only, only God gives wisdom. The, the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, he's the father of glory, that he might give you, who you and I, the spirit of wisdom. It comes from him and a revelation and a knowledge. What's the significance? These seven torches, these seven spirits, it's that God does everything in wisdom. God is the author of wisdom. God's the giver of wisdom. We need his wisdom. The significance is this. We go to him for wisdom. James chapter 1. When we lack wisdom, if you lack wisdom, and you do, that's rhetorical. When you lack wisdom, what do we do? We run to Christ. We run, we run to the Father. We run to God. We say, God, I need wisdom. I need it right now. I need it today. I need wisdom to know my next step. I need wisdom to live and breathe and function and move and serve. God, I need wisdom. God, I need wisdom. And it says here, God will give what? Generously. When we ask him in faith, when we believe him, not only from our heart and intellectually and mentally, but when we believe him from the practice of our life, when we believe him without doubt, doesn't mean, it doesn't mean that we have all the answers, but we believe him because faith is being exercised in my life. Even though I don't have all the answers, I still step forward. I still am obedient. That's what it means to, to come to him without doubt. It doesn't mean that we don't have the answers, that we're still questioning, but it means that we're moving forward in faith, even though we can't figure it all out. So we come to him for wisdom. Verse 6, we continue. And he says, not only that, but verse before the throne, there was, as it were, he's trying to describe this, a sea of glass like crystal. He's trying to describe what he sees. It's a sea of glass, crystal. It's, it's smooth. It's peaceful. It's brilliant. It's brilliant. Glass like this, crystal like this, didn't exist in John's day. And if it did, it was rare to the extreme, because simply the, the, 
the, the ability wasn't there, and only the wealthiest of the wealthy could even have glass, even approached being able to see through with clarity, right? It reminds us that that sea of glass, that God is the author of peace. It is a, it is a description and a portrayal of the peace of God that he offers. It's not symbolic there. It just simply shows us. It just We have that sense we're going to see that. And yet it's a reminder that God is, is judge as well. How do we get that from here? Well, let's look. Let's see. Exodus chapter 24. Moses, Aaron, Nadab, Abihu, the 70 elders of Israel, they go up on Mount Sinai with God. And they saw the God of Israel. And there was under his feet, as it were, a pavement of sapphire stone like the very heaven for clearness. That's how, that's how he could describe it. It was just a floor of clarity, of crystal, of purity, of glass. And God, he did not lay his hand on the chief men of the people of Israel. They beheld God and they ate and drank. They didn't see God face to face, as it were. They didn't see him in his purity and his essence. They saw, they saw a, a glimpse of him. But the beauty is here. They experienced the peace of God because they were able to have communion before God and with God. It's, it gives us a glimpse as to what we have, the privilege we have as believers today to have communion and fellowship with him and prayer at the Lord's table and fellowship each day as we walk with him. This is rare indeed in the Old Testament, this kind of opportunity. It's the only kind. It's the only expression like this that I know. Revelation chapter 15, but it changes. There's, a, there's an element here. That's why I said it's, a, it's an image of God's peace, but it's an also an image of God's judgment. How do we get that from here? Well, let's look at Revelation 15. We move later into the book of Revelation. I saw what appeared to be a sea, a sea of glass mingled with what? With fire. Those who had conquered the beast and its name and the number of its name, they were standing beside the sea of glass with harps of gold in their hands. Judgment is being poured out. There is peace, the peace of knowing that God is in control, the peace that they are, they are finally home with him, and yet there is the... There is the wrath of God, the judgment of God that is also mingled with that description, with that picture that's unfolding. What's the significance here? God's wrath is going to be, is going to take place. God ju is judging today, right? He's judging the church even today. Let him judge us now so that he won't judge us then, right? He's taking care of sin in our life now. But here's, here's the wonderful thing. You and I, whether you know Jesus Christ or not, you and I can be at peace through faith in Jesus Christ. We, we can be right with God through faith. Be at peace with God through Jesus Christ. If you know Jesus Christ, then you, can, then you are able to experience the peace, that sea of glass experience in your life. Or no matter if it's mingled with fire and there's adversity and there's wrath and there's judgment and there's, and there's the work of God against sin in this world, we can be at peace because we're in the very hands and in the very presence of God. He walks with us. He cares for us. He holds us. Romans 8, 6. And so we set our mind on the Spirit of God. The things of God through the Spirit of God, the Word of God and wisdom, we set our mind on that. Ephesians 6 says this. This is beautiful. The gospel itself is just this. It's good news because it's peace. The result of the gospel, the impact of the gospel is peace in our life. Even though I'm going through adversity and hardship in my life, I do experience the peace of God. You can experience the peace of God. Peace of God by being at peace with God. So my, my challenge to you is this, that you simply know Christ. As you catch this glimpse of Jesus, of God the Father on the throne, He's in control. He is mingling the attributes of His majesty, His holiness, His peace, with the coming true attributes of His wrath and judgment against sin, of His righteousness in doing that, that He is just in doing that, that He is a God who always does what is right, and nothing that he does can ever be questioned because he's God. We're going to see more about that next week. We're going to continue that next week. Next week, we're going to continue part two. God is worthy. Folks, he's worthy. He's worthy to do anything in our life that he chooses to do. He's worthy to do anything in our culture that he chooses to do. He's worthy to turn kingdoms upside down, nations upside down, elections upside down, diseases and, and, and the safety of people upside down. He's worthy to do whatever he chooses I can't understand all that he does, and neither can you. But we can know this. He is a God who is always good. He is a God who brings peace to this world. He is a God who allows us to be in relationship with him, even though he is inaccessible, inapproachable, and yet he gives us access to the very throne room of grace. 
Isn't that an oxymoron? Think about that. What a beautiful God we have. He is worthy. He is worthy. May you worship him in your life. May your life reflect that worship. May your life and mine, folks, may we, may we honor him and all that we do because these things are true. This is the Savior. This is the God. This is our Father that we serve. We serve him who is on the throne. May he be on the throne of our heart. May he have first place in our heart. May he be the priority in our heart as he is in this scene. Everything, that's, everything that surrounds him here in this eternal scene, this heavenly scene, is there for one purpose. is to serve him. We have been created for one purpose. To serve him. Adam and Eve were created for one purpose. To serve him. They chose not to and sin defiled them and the rest of the world. Every day the Lord calls us back to that purpose. To serve him and to honor and glorify him. Because... Because this is who He is. Lord, direct our hearts and our minds, our purpose, our motivations to this scene, to the God who is on the throne, who is majestic beyond words. Move our hearts, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for joining with us, and we'll see you next week.